From the Amplified Growth Studios in Alexandria, Virginia, this is Association Chat with your host, Kiki Latalian. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Association Chat, your weekly online discussion for the association community, where we warm our hearts and ourselves by the virtual fire with topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalien, and I want to give a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, Fontiva. Fontiva is the AMS for innovation and their ongoing support of association chat and the community here is spectacular. It's just, they have been fabulous working with us all of 2017 and now into 2018. So if you're on Crowdcast, you can click the little call to action button below to check out Fontiva. And if you're listening to this right now on Facebook Live, Periscope, Twitter, or later on iTunes or iHeartRadio, you can just visit Fontiva.com for more about them. But on to the show. So today's show is a personal one for a lot of us. There's been a groundswell of focus on equal rights for women and whether you started noticing it when you saw women everywhere wearing pink hats with little hints of cat ears, otherwise known as pussy hats, or reading the headlines daily with the Me Too movement, things are really heating up when it comes to issues like sexual harassment in the workplace. But why is this still such an issue in today's world? And why is it reaching a boiling point now? And on a practical note, how does all of this impact the Association of Meetings and Hospitality Industries? There's so many questions. And here with us today to help dissect and discuss them is our special guest, Ashley Milne Tite. Ashley Milne Tite, uh, I'm gonna, I have to say a few words about you. The, um, Ashley Milne-Tite is the host of the Broad Experience podcast on women in the workplace. And she's also a public radio reporter with her work being recognized regularly on shows like Marketplace. She's on NPR. You might have heard her on the BBC and elsewhere. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's nice to be here. Yes. So, you know, this is such a tough topic and uh, it's something that's very complicated and gets people stirred up. Uh, quickly. And, and uh, you know, I want to start out with an easy question so that people can get to know you a little bit better um, and why you're here. So could you tell us a little bit more about your podcast, The Broad Experience, you know, what it is and how it came to be? Sure. So I started it in 2012. So almost coming up for six years in March. So long before the podcast revolution that's, that's, uh, that sprung up in the last couple of years for those of your listeners who are who are also podcast listeners. And I started it because, so some of my favorite pieces of reporting from, from Marketplace, uh, which is the business radio, had been about some aspect of women's lives. And I was on an entrepreneurial journalism program at CUNY, which is the City University of New York. And we all had to give birth to a media business. And I knew I wanted to do, obviously it was going to be audio because audio is my favorite medium. It's <laughs> the most intimate medium there is. And I love telling stories for radio and writing for radio and for the ear. So I knew I was going to do a podcast and I knew it wanted to be, I, I, wanted, I wanted it to be about women. And then I, my professors there said, well, you need to go smaller than that. You need to go niche, niche, as I would say, mm-hmm. you I pick, pick something within that because women is just too broad. So I, and I thought about my own experiences in my last job and which had been varied and interesting. And there was a situation that I often thought back to subsequently where I was not promoted over a younger guy. And Mm -hmm. that losing out on that made me think a lot, not just about the different ways in which we both behaved in in going for that job, but also about the way I was raised and had been taught or not to promote myself at work. So I had all that going around in my head about my own experiences in the workplace. And um, I also knew some of the statistics, like women are hugely educated and we're now graduating from college in higher numbers than men and were five, six years ago. But with, with this very, there's no parity uh, and when it comes to the workplace and pay. And so I thought, I just thought it was a really interesting discrepancy. And at the time, very few people were talking about it. It was, it was a conversation people had 
in you know by the water cooler or in sections of blogs online but it wasn't a subject of international conversation as it became you know within about a year and a half after Sheryl Sandberg published her book Lean In but really when I started I felt this was not, this was an important conversation, but it wasn't one that people were having in droves. And I wanted to be that. So that's why I started the show. Well, I mean, it's very timely. Obviously, you yeah. were right in, you were t on the on the pulse of, of what was happening in, in the country and I guess worldwide. And I was going to ask you, you know, when you started having these interviews and you, and you go in and you start talking with women, were they like, were they like you? Did they did did you start to discover that they had uh, a lot of these stories of, you know, uh, sexual harassment or facing some sort of sexual or gender discrimination in the workplace? Or did that not come up? Well, no, sure. Certainly some form of gender discrimination came up a lot, mm -hmm. whether it but, you know, some of it they talked about as, as being you know, unconscious bias on somebody else's part. So. That was the nub of a lot of the things I talked about, because it is it, it is the reason why a lot of women perhaps don't progress as fast as they'd like or to quite where they would like. But harassment, it came up sporadic. But it what I actually not until I chose to do a show about this topic, which was before any of this came up, this was. Um, oh gosh, a year and a half to two years ago, I picked it as a topic, yeah. partly because, because one of my listeners actually in London had written to me and told me this story. And I thought, I can't believe this is still going on like this. And she was about 27, 28 and had a much older, lecherous man at her office, very high up, um, you know, putting his hands all over her office party and saying pretty gross things. And I thought, let's do a show on this because obviously, this is still happening. And, yeah. and, but, you know, until then, I have to say, I think this is what's so interesting about what's going on now and this explosion of stories. When I, when I talked to that young woman and then interviewed another woman, a professor who specializes, is she's made a study of sexual harassment and the reasons for it. It was still kind of something that wasn't discussed. Like you all knew everyone has, most people had some kind of experience of it, but unless it was something truly terrible like assault or, or they'd had to leave a job because of it, they didn't make a big deal of it. So it really wasn't until I did that show and then that was the year that revelations about then have presidential candidate Trump and the Hollywood Access Hollywood tapes, all that came out a few months after I, I did that show and sexual harassment became a bigger topic of discussion in the context of um, presidential candidates, but it re really it was only this fall that it exploded into the headlines and it hasn't stopped. Yeah, and I mean, I have to say, I have to give a, a shout out to Amanda who's watching right now. She'll recognize both this coffee mug uh, that she sent along with this, which is perfect for today's, uh, <laughs> yay! She's saying yay uh, for today's discussion. <laughs> DIY rules for a WTF world: uh, How to speak up, get creative, and change the world. And this is by the creator of the Pussy Hat Project, the person who actually like put together this whole concept of this sea of pink that we saw with the Women's March. Um, you know, after President. Trump was, it's still hard to say it, uh, was elected. And so, um, so uh, you know, I, I think that it's hard for me to look at this topic and to figure out how I had blinders on for so long to um, our power to change things. And the reason I say that is I have a daughter who is now 10 years old. And I like to think that, I mean, you know, I'm out there marching and I'm doing all of these things, but I didn't realize until some of the Me Too stuff and some of uh, the discussion that's happening, you know, now in Hollywood and in Silicon Valley, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, maybe there were still things that we needed to do uh, in order to change it so that I didn't just teach her to learn how to navigate and expect that this would be something that she faces, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's, it's disturbing to me that it was almost like, well, that's just 
things are, you know? Yeah. Why do you think now, I mean, why do you, why do you think that this is, this is getting to the boiling point as it is now? Purely because of the Harley, Harvey Weinstein revelations. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that, and I think it was, I think it was the New York Times that broke that story first. I mean, great reporting brought those stories to light. And then it just became this incredible snowball or domino effect where more and more stories spilled out. And so I, I, I absolutely put it down to those revelations. So it started in Hollywood and then it just cascaded and voices in every industry started being raised and saying, this is happening here. We've been putting, we've been putting up with this for years. And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the me too movement on social media where people were asked to sort of essentially say, if this had happened to you as well. I mean, and I mean that, so yeah, it started with, revelations of a very powerful man who everyone had heard of. And I think as more and more women of actresses, I mean, I remember being really surprised when I saw on you know, my phone, New York Times homepage that Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie yeah. were speaking up and saying they had been um, propositioned by Weinstein. I thought, wow, this is really becoming something. And that was only a few, a few days in. So in retrospect, it, it's not surprising that it it, it spilled into the, the normal normal person world where the rest of us live and became something that we felt we could talk about more openly as well. I think it's an, I think it's a, a great thing. I mean, you know, Hollywood can be incredibly self-centered and feel very distant for most of our lives. But this, this has been a way where something that's happened there has really helped um, other women in all, all different parts of life and professions, I think. I think so too. It, it's it's such an interesting thing that um, it's just an interesting time to watch all of this sort of unfold. Yeah. And you know, I, I remember when I first reached out to you, and uh, you said, "Well, I I am not going to be able to do it right away, but you know, I have a feeling we'll still be talking about these issues when I get back." And I was like, "Well." I don't know if it's going to stay in on TMZ the way it is now. And it is, it's still here we are and it's still being discussed and even more so. And so, um, you know, I think that that just is speaking to the fact that things really do seem to be changing. And for whatever reason, you know, people are feeling like they can, they can speak up. They have role models, they have examples for the association and meetings and hospitality industry, this is definitely of interest because there have been uh, articles that have come out talking about how the hospitality industry, for instance, um, you know, the things that were uh, unveiled with what was happening at, at places like the Plaza in New mm -hmm. York, um, you know, these discussions and bringing these situations to light uh, it's, it's changing a lot. And if I were a meeting planner or, uh, I worked in an association where I had, you know, the final say on where we were going to hold an event, I think I would start to have to question that too now. So, you know, what are your thoughts on sort of, you know, some of the impact that you can imagine this having on our audience, this audience today? Mm, that's a really big question. It is. It's huge. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's a lot to it's a lot to think about. It's, I know, especially as I especially as I am an outsider. So I'm looking in from the outside. I mean, one thing that was really interesting is um, Convene magazine, which I'm sure plenty of uh, listeners read or have read. They did. They actually have a great a piece out this month talking about sexual harassment in the meetings industry. Mm -hmm. And they did a survey of meeting planners, knowing that the vast majority of meeting planners are women. And they didn't, I mean, they, they had a hundred, out of the large number of people they surveyed, they got a hundred responses. So it's not a, scientific, a scientific survey, which they admit, but 80% of those respondents said, yes, they had been harassed, mm -hmm. you know, in their, in their career in some way, shape or form. And I, obviously they then, they asked other questions as well. And I can't remember all of those, but it was ar arresting the 80%. And, but if you think about it, I mean, I hardly need to, need to tell everyone this, but it's hardly surprising given that whole hospitality vibe and, 
and alcohol being a big part of the way people mm -hmm. relax and just that fuzzy area where some people feel that they can overstep the boundaries. There's a ton to think about. Um, and I mean, it's got to be really difficult. Maybe this is one of the industries where it's a most difficult thing to grapple with because of the hospitality element. Mm -hmm. And, and, but I mean, nobody should feel that hospitality involves touching someone or who doesn't want to be touched or groping them or saying something disgusting or propositioning them while they're on the job. It just mm -hmm. shouldn't, it shouldn't anywhere, but particularly in this, in this um, arena. And I mean, I was reading something on, you know, Harvard Business Review is doing quite a bit on this topic, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I read a great piece that uh, um, was written by a couple of experts in employment law that today, and one of, you know, the point that they made, these two women was, nobody should feel uncomfortable or, or threatened while they are at work. And that's what this is. Um, it's people who want to just do their work and get their work done in a professional manner. And we shouldn't have to, we, we shouldn't have to be scared or at the very least uncomfortable while we're doing that. Is it, you know, I, with the fascinating thing about uh, this industry and I, and I'm, I'm referring right now to associations, the association industry is that, you know, I had a discussion with my husband who I think is, he's a somewhat progressive man who is very supportive of women. And this is before, um, kind of around when um, the the Access Hollywood uh, recording had come out with, with Donald Trump. And he said, you know, I, I think that it's things are about equal with women now. Oh, now, now, you know, and I said, I said, how can you say that? How can you say that? I said, it, it doesn't even have to do with pay at this point. It also has to do with the fact that I can't, if I know a woman very well at all, I know it, like I've heard her story. I, I, I couldn't yeah. think of any woman that I knew very well at all who didn't have a story about some kind of related to sexual harassment or worse in the workplace. And that is frightening. And I, I just had never thought of it that way. But, but when I said it to him, it was such a, an awakening for him. He said, really? And, you know, since then I've been sort of thinking, I've been waiting to have the, the magical unicorn of somebody I know very well who hasn't had that. And I still, it's, hasn't. yeah, it eludes yeah. me <laughs> and that's terrible yeah. and terrifying. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, you know, I was talking with a, a younger woman who she's now, uh, an entrepreneur in the association space, but she was telling me about her story and how she had experienced, uh, people grabbing her at, you know, uh, the receptions and, uh, basically a question of whether she lost her job or not related to, you know, some allegations that she, mm. and, um, you know, and I even remember when I first started working with an association and, uh, I won't name which one, but I was, uh, out visiting a chapter leader and he got very grabby and, and, you know, multiple times. And when I came back, you know, I told the the director uh, who oversaw me and uh, his response was, well, did you get any memberships out of it with a laugh? And yeah. uh, I just can't even imagine how that was OK with me. It wasn't OK with me then, but I didn't feel like I could do anything. Yeah. And it's also there's something very subtle that goes on. Um I think in our brains when this kind of thing happens, when somebody else minimizes it, part of you wants to minimize it as well. Part yeah. of you thinks, oh, well, is this as big a deal as I, I think it is or I thought it was at the time? That that whole thing that happens to us of questioning ourselves, not trusting ourselves comes out in those interactions. And that's, you know, that's that's something that I, I think, unfortunately, many women still doubt ourselves in many areas but sometimes at these moments as well because the whole of society has essentially been telling us to kind of put up and shut up for millennia so right. it's not really surprising in a way that at least some of us 
don't push as hard after a after an experience like that. I mean, some of the tales that I was reading about in this Convene article were along the same lines. One woman had a similar experience to you where her boss just, uh, he laughed and minimized it and uh, and just, just said, oh, you know, someone getting a bit handsy, you know, so ah. like it's, he seemed to think it was part of doing business, but it wasn't happening right. to him. Right, right. And I think that's the thing is that for some people, there was almost this ex expectation. Even for me, there was this expectation that, well, if you're smart, you learn how to navigate and, and sort of, well, I'll just, ha ha, we all know the laugh, you know, ha ha, you're just really drunk or, <laughs> you know, and you sort of maneuver your way away from that. And I just wonder how much longer it's supposed to stay like that. Amanda, you say, yes, women are so often seen as emotional or hysterical that we question if we're overreacting in fear of being seen that way. Yeah. 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 As being totally. the emotional, the emotional woman. Um, and also, as you point out, there's business at stake, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in this industry in particular, it's about your interacting with people from whom you need to win business. And that's why, you know, these stories of lobbyists that a lot of us have read about are horrible female lobbyists and feeling like their business in some cases has rested upon them acquiescing to, you know, a sexual encounter. It's, it's awful. It is. You know, this is a good time for me, a good moment for me to remind people who are watching live. One of the benefits of being able to participate in this, this chat live weekly is that we have polls and we have the ability to ask guests uh, your questions. So if you have a question and you're part of Crowdcast or if you are watching through Facebook Live, I am monitoring those and you can ask those questions. Um, you can ask those questions on those places. If you're watching through Twitter or YouTube, unfortunately, I can't, I can't keep track of it all. But uh, feel free to ask your questions and do take a, a moment to go through the poll if you're in Crowdcast because there are three questions there. The first one's starting with, have you experienced it yourself on the, in the workplace? And the second being, or do you know someone who has? And I'm just very curious to find out about the people who are watching right now and what your own experience has been. So, oh, go ahead, Ashley. No, I was just going to say one thing I, I would like to know about, because I've been thinking about this since yesterday, is are, are people's organizations having, are they, are they being open about this? Are they having conversations with you about your, about your experiences? Is, I, I'm just, I'm very curious to know if anyone is being open because I was asked a question yesterday about what, you know, what, how, you know, how companies should respond in this, that, what, what some people may be reading about already, which is a, a, a sort of male backlash and that now men are feeling, oh, am I going to be, is it safe for me to travel with a woman and, and right. all this kind of thing? Are they going to do a Mike Pence where they only go out to dinner with their wife kind of thing? And um, what, one of the things I, I think the, one of my listeners actually brought up in a Facebook discussion, I was having my show about this, was, well, why don't people have open conversations? Why don't companies talk to their employees and say, so do we want to keep the status quo? Are, are you happy traveling with your male colleagues? It, it, she pointed out that we're, we're all living in a bit of people seem to be living in a fear right now. And there's a lot of whispering about the way things may be changing. But I wonder if any companies are having candid, open conversations with their staffs about this, which I think would be hugely helpful to, to moving things forward. Yeah, you know, that's such a good question, because um, because of all the reasons that you say, I think that having that open conversation, at least, you know, it, you're able to to find where there might be a trouble spot before waiting for it to surprise you in some, yeah. you know, unsavory or before, way. <laughs> or before launching some kind of blanket policy that might seem ridiculous to some people. I mean, at least before you do that, I, I feel like the, the employees who are actually on the ground living this should be part of it. Oh, wow. So Joan says, yes, my spouse works for an association and they are now. And on Collaborate, Sherry Martz has been in Collaborate for everyone who's listening. Uh, this is the online uh, community for members of the American Society of Association Executive or 
executives or ASAE. Uh, she says, and now collaborate. Sherry Martz has been outspoken for some time and is helping associations and others write policies. That's so true. Sherry Martz, a uh, well-known thought leader on this very topic. And I remember seeing the discussions over and over again, her beating the drum before this became top of mind for everyone else in the media. And so uh, interesting stuff, this this. The stuff that, that people have been talking about and now, now it's becoming mission critical to make sure that your policies uh, at least have been, uh, you know, are up to speed or thought about a little bit more clearly on this. Oh, and there was an addition to that. I yes, think. There, there are a couple of people chiming. <laughs> uh, well, so Joan says, that said, I see few changes even with policies and I won't live long enough to see changes seriously. Oh, I hate hearing that. And then, and then uh, Scott uh, says, what a great opportunity for an association to share resources that companies in their industry could use to foster those conversations. Yeah, it is a great opportunity. Yeah, and I think um, this, you know, the, this piece, actually Joan yesterday pointed me to this piece in the, in the Washington Post about, oh, I can't remember the title, but it was essentially the... The new work, the new workplace rules. What's the new normal in this post Me Too era? But it, it had a lot of. It started with a lot of quotes about men thinking, "Ooh, is it is it okay for me to swear and and talk smack in front of my female colleagues?" And this was in a sort of a, a more a firefighting situation, so slightly different than being in an office. But but somebody else was questioning whether to be in a closed door meeting with a woman. But but the rep actually. To refuse to meet with a woman with a closed door, if you're going to do the same with a man, counts as discrimination. So, right. but I, I, I think, I mean, as this, this great uh, Harvard Business Review piece pointed out today, it, it, it actually shouldn't be, it sh really should not be difficult to behave like a normal human being and treat, if you're a, if you're a guy and treat, well, if you're anyone but since we know that most harassment is man on woman harassment and to just treat the person you're with as you would want somebody in your life that you love to be treated, which is with dignity and respect and not to be subtly hitting on her or, or you know, yeah. talking about, um, you know, what her boobs look like. I mean, this is just to me basic common sense. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a little bit to start going down this route where men are talking about being worried i think that slightly takes us away from from the important stuff that we should be we should be talking about mm -hmm. no i i completely agree i think that you know going the the fear route if you i guess if you are fearful because uh there are some things being brought up that you yourself are guilty of then maybe that's a good and change maybe some of your behavior if it if it sounds like some of the things these people are getting in trouble for <laughs> are similar to what you yourself do but but beyond that if it's somebody who you know i i've heard men uh, my husband i'll throw him under the bus uh, i've heard uh, my husband saying well what about the jokes that i tell you know what about the jokes that i tell uh if they're racy or something like that uh should i not be saying them in front of a female colleague and I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know. Are you telling them in front of your male colleagues at work? And like, how do you feel about that? And I don't know. It makes me nervous mm. about what kind of jokes he's telling, to be honest. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. And that can divide people because there's a whole, there's, a, I mean, I did a show, uh, my last show of the year that I produced, I called it The Reckoning. And I, I talked to two women who had quite different opinions about, this everything that's going on and the upshot and and the first woman I spoke to was was concerned about what me too might be doing to workplace relationships and that that actually this could be a bad thing for women in the workplace because then men, men would just want to shut them out more and in fact another of my listeners brought this up yesterday in a slightly different way um and and she said you know if you're seen as a grenade that could go, go off at any time. And, uh, you, you know, she's like, men don't mentor grenades. They don't promote grenades. They don't, you know, and, and she wasn't, she wasn't agreeing that women were that, but she said, if this is the perception 
then it's really bad for us. And she and and she was and she was angry about the forces that were leading that to be the perception. But she said, "This is my worry that somehow." Ultimately, I could be harmed by this if I am seen as an emotional grenade that could go off at any minute and could report something that really is nothing and get a man in trouble. That's such, you know, and and that is that's what you're saying right now. I think a lot of this is being discussed in the chat p- portion of of Crowdcast right now, where the conversation's going like this, you guys. So if you're listening to this mm-hmm. later, it, it's a lot of discussion about. Well, okay, so things can get really awkward if you are a woman and you go out to dinner with a male colleague, you know, but the problem is, is does your gender, if, if the idea becomes it's, you are like this, this grenade that could go off, does that keep you from advancing because you can't be asked to dinner where you have those discussions that lead to you moving forward in your job? Um, not talking about romantic dinners here, talking about opportunities where you are able to talk about a project or talk about your your ideas for the direction of an organization where you might be recognized as, you know, someone who is worth promoting. And to be honest, I mean, somebody's pointed this out, um, talking about meeting off site and how that may not be a great idea in in the first place. I mean, I, in my world, I don't think I've ever had a dinner with a male supervisor, not that I recall, um, maybe a lunch, but I've worked for myself for some years now. So my, <laughs> my yeah. organizational days are fading <laughs> into the distance. But I think I would feel a bit weird having dinner because you know what it's like. It, it, it is different at the end of the day. And if there are people are feeling like I'm kind of not on office time anymore, I'm more relaxed. Maybe there's wine involved. Yeah. I can, I, I, I do feel a little bit ambivalent about dinner, but I'm, I'm not in the hospitality industry. And I would think that in the hospitality and meetings industry, it's, it's quite, you know, any, anything's up for grabs because, because of the, just the, the, the way what your business is about. Well, you know, I have to say that, um, you know, honestly, I want to push back and say it should be totally fine for me to go out and have drinks with somebody uh, for happy hour or whatever, where we're, we're peers or something. I work for myself. I work for myself and I'm I'm thinking, well, yeah, the end of the day, you're going to go grab something who knows. And, but if I'm honest, I am very aware of it now. And I think it's just, um, you know, if it's not with a group and it's somebody else, I do try to suggest rescheduling for like a, a coffee during the day or something where there are other people who are around where it may not be both viewed from outsiders as something that it's not, or it could lead to there being some sort of awkward situation. Mm. So I think um, it is an interesting, it is an interesting situation that what does that mean that maybe women who are younger, uh, I mean, because I didn't always feel this way, you know, I, I, for many years would have been the person who showed up and said, yes, Tom, hi, let's have, let's meet for drinks and yay, how was your day? And not think anything of it, not think anything of it. But, um, you know, now I think that I do, I do, I'm aware of it, if I'm honest. But yeah, as someone, um, uh, it says here, you know, professional behavior should look the same despite the location of the meeting. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, uh, um, another something else. Um, I was actually in res- in response to this Washington Post piece that Joan Eisenstadt pointed me to. I was reading some of the comments, and of course, it's had it had like a thousand and thir- you know thirteen hundred comments yesterday. But what the one of the ones that had been flagged, one of the more sort of sensible and sober ones. Uh, was um, was talking about the fact that the woman a woman said I travel frequently with a male colleague we're adults we respect each other we treat each other with dignity that's not going to change I wouldn't want anything to change because our whole our relationship is based on trust and, and respect you would hope that you would hope that all professional relationships are based on on trust and respect of course they're not but I liked her point because I think it would be pretty awful if some blanket policy came in that segregated the sexes because that's not going to help anyone either no 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 and it could probably hurt more than help in a lot of cases so um 
You know, and, and some of the discussion over here is about if we become comfortable discussing the awkward situations in the moment, maybe it'll become easier. Um, others agreeing and others saying, hey, but who brings it up? What's the protocol for that? So these are all, I think, yeah. very, very fair questions. And definitely, I think it reflects just how complicated all of this is. Um, you know, in Amanda's case, and Amanda, I hope you don't mind me just, you know, talking a little bit about this, but she she brings up when I travel, it's almost always just me and Jeremy. Jeremy is her boss with Matt D, and I love these guys. In fact, we met when they came into the D.C. area um, and grabbed some drinks together. Uh, she said, if I wasn't allowed to go on those trips, that would have greatly affected my success. And, you know, that is that is a concern because... Like, what if she just couldn't go because it was considered improper or somehow other people would view it that way? I, You know, that would harm her advancing in her career. Joan has a great question over here. She says, do you think there's an age implication that older boomer women, and I'll even add Gen X women, I'll throw myself in there, uh, are more tolerant of bad harassing behavior because that's what we always had in our lives? Um, mm, oh, I hate to, I hate to sort of put it all on a generation. I mean, in, I do, th so my, my experience at with being someone who does a show on this and gets comments and interacts with listeners and all the rest of it is that I do think that in, in general, I'm just going to say that in general, it, <laughs> I do think that there's a generational aspect to this. I do think that women who have been in the workforce or just been around for, for decades because they've had to put up with a lot of this. And this was just part of working, just dealing with it, that they oftentimes don't have as negative a reaction to what's going on as millennial women, women for instance, in general, again, I, I found that I'm Gen X as well. I found that women in their twenties have a much more black and white um, attitude to harassment stuff, and a, a little a, can be more likely to be hard on every aspect from assault on down. Whereas there mm -hmm. are some situations where I think that guy was just is really awkward, and he doesn't know how to communicate. He's not being gross. He he's actually just inept. I'm more likely to separate those out. And I have found that some young women I know are not. So those, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of differences I notice. But I don't want to I don't want to say that all boomer women are like this, because I've also seen incredibly strong reactions on the on the on the other side. But I, I, I do think in general, it can fall along reactions can fall along generational lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so Paula says, I think that when we see an older, i.e. boomer man harassing someone, some of us do talk it up to his age and upbringing. And I'll liken this to, you know, when you hear someone uh, making a, a racist joke and they are from a certain part of the, the world, maybe with a certain background and at a certain age, and they just culturally or because of a socially uh who they surround themselves with and what their background is. We're just like, Oh, they don't know, you know, they, they're, they're mm -hmm. whatever, you know, let's dismiss this because we know that that's silly or that's just their experience. And it's something that, um, you know, can't teach an old dog, new tricks kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, and I think that that, you know, dealing with that is a whole other question because, you know, is that something where, we need to be uncomfortable and step outside and say, okay, you know, that that's not funny or that's not right, or that's not appropriate. I, you know, or do we just walk away? What do we do in those situations? Oh, yeah. It's so difficult. I think it would depend on the situation. I mean, again, I, for another a past show, um, I did a show that was about that, what I call the lesser, the, I call that, you know, the lesser aspects of sexual harassment. So, the, the casual nicknames, the the comments, not the gropey stuff. And and I, I interviewed two boomer women and and they they felt that if it was an older guy, what they call a dirty grandpa, that talking to him, trying to educate him 
um, and I can't remember the phrases they suggested, but but trying, you know, speaking up was was worth it, you know. Um, but so much. Let's face it. I mean, all the people who've been through this, so much depends on where you are. Are you in a close space with this person? Is this person really drunk? Could they get violent? There are so many so many ingredients that go into this that depend on the circumstance itself. I think it's really hard to give blanket advice, but I but I remember these women specifically saying, "You can you can just you just have to educate that person and say, no, that makes me feel uncomfortable. You don't do that." what I, you know right whatever taking taking responsibility for um you know your choice of reaction as well you know and and Rachel says I'm a mother of two teenage boys uh one's very close to adulthood I teach affirmative yes means yes consent and respect and boundaries but I'm still very scared for them in their 20s when the Aziz article broke my stomach dropped because I don't want one accidental momentary lapse to permanently brand them in their careers yeah and you know oh. I was reading that article too and and all of the uproar and the discussion that's happened since then and for those of you who who aren't aware um, this is referring to an article about a celebrity who had met a young a woman who he had set up a date. There uh, was consensual sexual activity. They didn't actually have intercourse. Um, but because she felt sort of pressured and felt uncomfortable and felt like, um, you know, that she had been disrespected in some ways later, um, she texted him and said that she had, you know, sort of felt comfortable and he apologized. Or oh, uncomfortable later. Uncomfortable later. Um, and he apologized for making her feel uncomfortable. And she still got angry when she saw him with the pin at the awards show, showing his support for women and talked with a, a journalist who posted this article, which was seen as being unnecessarily inflammatory by a lot of people. And also not, I have to say, as a, as a real journalist, not journalistic. Right. It was not, it's right. not, it's a questionable whether it's a journalism publication and they, they use practices that no journalist would be allowed to use. So right. keeping the woman anonymous and having her speak through a writer, it was, it was, it wasn't very professionally done. So that was one of the problems with the piece. And so that he was, he was roasted um, and she gets to retain her anonymity. So that was, I think, one of the problems that a lot of people had with it. But yeah, it's a different situation because it's not workplace related. It's, it's about, it's about, yeah, what were the boundaries of consent? But I mean, a common, I think a, a common thread is even what you mentioned, Kiki, earlier about, um, you know, as a woman, your own reaction at the time and how we're, we're sort of, so many of us are trained most not to trust ourselves and also to essentially be pleasant and to please men, to please mm -hmm. everyone, let's face it, but, but, but particularly not to upset men and to keep them happy. And I think um, that's uh, that this young woman is a claim that the reason that she didn't just leave when he was suggesting sexual activity that she didn't want to comply with is because, it was, there was there was some of this going on and he was a celebrity and a big name and all the rest of it but yeah as, a, as i can understand that um a mother of, of sons might be worried about about this or i have to say and uh, his behavior did sound pretty boorish to me when i read the yeah, article yeah it did and and uh paula says some of us do not believe it was consensual when she repeatedly told him to slow down and chill out and he kept going and mm. so that's true too uh, this is a really great point that jo Joan asked a question. We talk about this as if it were only men to women. In the interviews for the blog, men responded as being harassed by other men and women. Why is this not a greater part of the conversation? It was in Time cover story. And that's such a good point. You know, when the Kevin Spacey news broke, um, I a lot of people were around me were talking about how surprised and disappointed they were. And I remember years ago having a gay friend of mine tell me when he was visiting, he was very, but, but he told me probably 10 years ago that um, he had been at a party where Kevin Spacey was, but everyone
told him to keep his distance because he was known as being handsy for young boys. And I mean, I it was definitely not a secret in that community for anybody who was relatively close or in proximity to him. So when people were talking about working with him on a day-to-day -day basis and not knowing, it's very hard to believe that when somebody on the periphery was still able to know. And so what about these men who are going in and um, you know they're experiencing the same sort of thing? They probably feel doubly challenged because you know they're facing society's pressures not to say anything. They're still worried about their jobs. How do they deal with it? And it doesn't have as much of a focus. Yeah, no, it's true. And I think that's because I st the vast majority of harassment is man to woman. But that said, I, and I think under that, it would be men, man on man, and then woman on woman. And one of the responses actually in the convened survey, obviously an anonymous, um, because, it, because one of the other questions they asked is, Oh, okay, so you were harassed and how many reported it? And it was a very low number that had reported it. It was something like 70 something percent had not reported it. And one of the reasons um, for not reporting it, that a man was reporting, he said, as a gay man, I didn't think I would be taken seriously. I didn't mm -hmm. think my, my, this incident would be taken seriously. And I actually interviewed a lawyer for one of the a public radio story I did on confidentiality agreements and harassment cases back in the fall, not long after this whole thing blew up. And she said that she was dealing with an increasing number of men. Like uh, she's a, she represents the, you know, the plaintiff. And she said, I'm dealing with, I have an increasing number of men coming to me with uh, harassment cases being, being harassed in the, virtually all cases with her by male superiors. Mm. So I just, it just doesn't get as much attention. I think, Possibly this this guy who reported to convene maybe um maybe um, emblematic and that less likely to say anything for fear of of ridicule maybe more more so even than a woman um, and the only I know of one I know of one case I read about of um, female on female harassment at a, at a startup which some of you may have read about um, which I read about in the last year or so that's the only that's the only case I've read of when that happens but of course then there are I have read cases of female bosses harassing male reports. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it does happen in all sorts of combinations and as, and that is why it's kind of coming up with some solution that keeps men and women away from each other doesn't answer the same sex harassment at all. Hmm. So I want to take a moment and actually give everyone a little update on the, the few who have voted so far. It's definitely not a scientific uh, poll because uh, there are only six people who have voted so far, but of those six people, have you ever experienced sexual harassment or worse in the workplace? A hundred percent. Yes. Um, do you know someone who has experienced sexual harassment or worse in the workplace? A seven votes of a hundred percent. Yes. And do you think the Me Too movement and Time's Up protest will create real lasting change? And this is maybe the most depressing uh, response that I can share with you all is that to 33%, 33.3% of the voters say no. And four votes, 66.7% unsure. And 0% oh. said yes. So oh, yeah, uh, it's... Uh, very depressing. All of that said, if you happen to come into Crowdcast, if you haven't cast your vote yet, please go ahead and cast your vote. I am very interested in seeing how people continue to, to respond to this poll. Uh, Amanda says, this became part of a discussion I was in around asking same gender employees to share a hotel room when traveling. I worked for a place that used to do this and another place where they wanted to do that pushback. Some companies do this, others don't. I understand how getting everyone their own hotel room can drive the travel costs up, but in my opinion, you cannot assume that just because people are the same gender that it's okay or safe to ask this of your employees. Oh, I know. And, and yeah. there's, there's so much more that goes into that too. <laughs> that is a very big issue and definitely something that I think organizations need to think about. For sure. Mm-hmm. So, and, and 
Uh, Deanna, she says that Amanda, I've always had a policy that I would never share a room and did not allow this for any staff members either. So true. There are so many different reasons why. I mean, when you think about people's privacy these days, I mean, we're, we're more careful about the way that we're storing their email address than we are with asking our staff to, to like share a hotel room, which is just wildly inappropriate, I think, in so many different ways. So, also, you know, you're, you're an event, you just desperately need to, I, I do anyway, if I'm at a conference or something, I'm just desperate to be on my own after yes, yeah. all the networking and, and schmoozing. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have to interact with another human. I think it's, uh, I really think it's only fair that on these work trips, you should have a hotel room to yourself. Mm -hmm. And Monica on Facebook, she says, a troubling part of this issue is the people who unwittingly enable people who sexually harass. She said that she's heard he doesn't mean anything by it or he's just a harmless, flirty guy. Don't read too much into it. She said she understands the difficulty when hearing about someone's questionable behavior. There are complicated layers to this issue. That said, there are sexual predators out there and they start with seemingly innocent comments to test one's personal boundaries like you always have the coolest shoes and it going into something else. We have no recourse but to keep our personal boundaries high and teach our children, boys too, to do the same. Yeah. So true. Um, and also, I, and I'm, I mean, people probably know this, but we shouldn't assume that just because like, you have a female boss that, you're, that your female boss is going to be supportive or back you up necessarily any more than the guy would because I've heard multiple stories of of female supervisors brushing off these comments just as just as a, a man might and there have been various cases in the news recently to to back that up so uh, it, there are it's so complicated and as one of my actually one of my guests said recently she knows she said you know if a woman has partly risen to her top position by dealing with sexual harassment in her own way which may mean putting up with it She's not going to be necessarily sympathetic to your concerns or any better at <coughs> broaching these within an organization than a male boss would be. Mm. It's just, it's such a nightmare. <laughs> so let's talk about something bright or hopeful or some way that we can actually, you know, sort of proactively go about doing something. Obviously, a lot of people are feeling like, according to the poll that we have here, uh, feeling like all of this action is not necessarily going to lead to any meaningful change. So what are some things that we can do as we move forward? What are some ways that um, association executives or people in the meetings and hospitality world, what are some things that we can do as we move forward to sort of, I don't know, protect ourselves or make better decisions as we move forward and are more aware of these issues? I mean, I think, and this came up before, but more open communication would be a great start. I can't pretend that I have all the answers yeah. for, you know, a particular industry. I just, I can't because I don't think anyone does anywhere, right? This is, we're right at the beginning of this thing. I know it feels like a long time for us, especially for women, mm -hmm. that, that something that concerns our lives so deeply has actually been in the news because it really has been since October and it's now almost February, but it really is, the very beginning of this as a as a phenomenon that's openly discussed in the culture. Uh, so I think I think because of that, I think it's going to take a, a really long time for this to sort of unspool and and for people for us to come to a place where we we've had some kind of reckoning and emerged on the other side. I don't think that's happening now. It's just too early. And we are having these skittish reactions of, oh, no, well, oh, I don't want to be in the same room with a woman then in, in case of in case she implies something. All this is going on now. I just think I just think more time is needed for 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 people to for everything to stop spinning mm -hmm. and for this to come to a stop. But in the meantime, I don't, I don't see how more communication and discussion around what makes people comfortable and uncomfortable couldn't be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that, I mean, HR is not always the best. You know, it just, yeah. it just isn't. You know, there have been, we've all read, we all know from some experience and we've read the articles, is HR your friend or foe in these situations? And it's, 
not always your friend because it really needs to protect the company. But I, I think too, too much of this has been living underground and hidden, right? Mm -hmm. We, as, as mostly as women, have been putting up with a lot and just talking about it amongst ourselves and, right. and, and just un writing it down and not giving it enough credence because we thought we had to. We thought we had to live that way. And so now that it's out here, out in the open, let's take the opportunity to talk about it with with um, people in HR and bosses and maybe colleagues as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and we have people in the chat who are agreeing as well. They're saying every company, no matter the size, should have a harassment policy. Right. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a small organization or a large organization, you, you definitely need something in place. And uh, Jeremy says, honestly, as a small company that's taken growth cues from larger firms, it's surprising how even larger firms don't really do this well, like the shared yeah. hotel room requests. I've never really been a fan of saving money over people's discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And so it's, it's a really interesting, interesting point. And this is an interesting time. And I have to say that, uh, Oh, Ashley, there are so many other things to discuss. <laughs> Where I know, it's like just scrape the surface. I know. <laughs> I feel like we just got started and, and we're already nearing the end. If people want to listen to, um, want to take in more of your podcast or want to find out more about you, where are some places they, that they can find you online? Oh, so uh, the podcast, if you want to check out the website, it's just thebroadexperience.com. And if, if you use a podcast app, just search for The Broad Experience in the app. Um, and where else? Twitter. It's just my name, which Ashley Milne type without the hyphen. You'll have to find it. I hope that's <laughs> written down somewhere because I don't want to spell it. Um, but but those are those are the places where, yeah, where all these issues right now are being discussed largely on, on my podcast, which is The Broad Experience. I can't wait to hear the next the next episode. How mm. regularly do the episodes come out? Every two weeks. Every two weeks. Oh, I'm definitely going to subscribe. Everybody subscribe, subscribe. I will have uh, information, the link in the show notes, uh, whether you're listening to it on the podcast later or whether you're looking uh, for this information on the website. So we'll definitely include that. And I just have to bring in a few of these comments saying, you know, maybe we need some good resources on uh, how to and where to start creating these sorts of policies. And somebody saying, I'm, I'm just so skeptic skeptical. I, I hope it gets better, but I'm really worried that there's a lot more suffering to come. So mm -hmm. thanks everybody for participating in this great show. Thank you, Ashley, for being a part of it. I am so happy that, that you are here. And even Thank though, you. even though I asked you some really hard questions, you were wonderful in the way that you responded. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's just, yeah, it's tough. I don't think any of us really know the answers. It's too, it would, we're, we're still at the beginning of this, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, every day in, in whatever publication you're looking at, you're going to be seeing more and more uh, stories like, you know, the ones we talked about today. So thank you to my guest today, Ashley, for joining us on Association Chat. And thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, next week, I'm going to be interviewing a man who has the Guinness World Record for writing uh, a song for the most consistent amount of time. He writes a song a day. He's been working on the same song for years and oh. writes a song every single day. Um, he performs uh, his songs at conferences everywhere, different venues, different events. And he's going to be talking about creativity and what he's learned from uh, about persistence and creativity uh, from writing a song a day for the past several years. <laughs> So I hope that you can all join in and participate in that. And until next time, everyone, keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of Association Chat. If you like this episode or even just the concept of the show, please subscribe and share it with your friends. We'd love to have them here.